Welcome. This is a program brought to you about the situation in Ukraine by the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. CERL, as we're known, is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting the rule of law in 21st century national security, warfare, and democratic governance. CERL draws from the study of law, philosophy, and ethics to answer the difficult questions that arise in times of war and contemporary transnational conflicts. Searle is affiliated with the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm very pleased to be able to bring you uh, this program today uh, of individuals who are affiliated with Searle either on our executive board or on our advisory council. Searle has particular expertise in the law of armed conflict of course, and uh, related themes uh, in transnational security. Our experts are lawyers, uh, retired military, philosophers, and academics from a number of different areas. And the current crisis in Ukraine draws on all of these areas to try to find common solutions uh, to this terrible situation that the world currently faces. Roughly two weeks ago, of course, uh, as you know, Russia invaded Ukraine and violated Ukrainian sovereignty in an aggressive act of international armed conflict. As time has gone on, the conflict has deepened, uh, become more and more serious, and Russia is now targeting civilians using forbidden weaponry, uh, negotiating false ceasefires, and targeting humanitarian corridors that it had previously established. We have now the largest refugee crisis in Europe since the Second World War and deep concerns about the possibility of escalation. NATO countries are struggling with the question of how to intervene in the current conflict without broadening the conflict and escalating to the point of a potential nuclear uh, com confrontation with Russia. There are many, many complications that have arisen just in the course of the last two weeks. Complications having to do with transfer of weaponry, transfer of fighter jets, humanitarian corridors, uh, and um, what to do for refugees, uh, as well as sanctions. We're going to cover only a small portion of this. Today's panel is going to be restricted to the tactical issues and the legal issues connected uh, with those uh, particular concerns. Uh, the situation is evolving very, very rapidly. Uh, and so we have been doing our best to track the events and to uh, be prepared to give you as clear uh, a description, an explanation of what's going on, as well as an analysis uh, by the experts associated with the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. So we'll be very eager for your comments and your thoughts and hope that you find this discussion helpful. In future, at future times, we will hope to have additional panels addressing some of the other aspects of the current crisis, and we welcome your suggestions. Uh, after uh, we have our discussion with our experts. We'll ask you to wade in with your questions and comments on the Q&A. Uh, anybody posting inappropriate comments will be removed from the session, uh, but we will do our best to address as many of your comments uh, with the panelists as possible in the time remaining after our discussion with our experts. So let me now uh, introduce in alphabetical order uh, our our distinguished panelists. First, we have Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell, who is the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law and the Research Professor of International Dispute Resolution at the University of Notre Dame Law School. I'm proud to say that she is a member of the Searle Advisory Council, an expert in international law and the law of force, and the former chair of the International Law Association Committee on the Use of Force, and a former military educator for the Department of Defense, teaching students from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, 
Mary Ellen O'Connell is uh, an extraordinary expert in the law of armed conflict and many areas connected with the current conflict, and uh, I'm delighted to have her on this panel. We next have uh, Harvey Rishkoff. Uh, Mr. Harvey Rishkoff is the former convening authority of the military commissions and former dean of the National War College. He is also a visiting professor of law at the Temple University Beasley School of Law, and I'm proud to say that he is a member of the Searle Executive Board. Uh, he, there is hardly an area in national security where Mr. Rushikoff is not uh, an expert, uh, and uh, many people rely on his expertise and consult him on a regular basis. I'm glad we'll have the opportunity to do so today. Uh, Colonel Yev Vindman is a U.S. Army JAG colonel, the twin brother of Alex Binman, who you will know, uh, among other things, from the uh, impeachment proceedings, um, and uh, the deputy advisor to the former deputy advisor to the National Security Council. Uh, right now, Yev does not have a formal affiliation with Searle, uh, but we are excited to be uh, hopefully bringing him on as a visiting uh, fellow. And I am getting a message that there is no audio. Is that correct? Let me hold off for a minute and see if we have a technical difficulty that needs solving. Claire, I can hear you fine. Uh, sounds like the audience is not hearing me, so I'm not sure. Okay, some people are hearing, so <laughs> very good, excuse me. Uh, and finally, we have uh, General Joseph Otell retired four-star general, former commander of U.S. Central Command in the U.S. Army. He is now the president and CEO of BENS, which is business executives for national security. And I'm very proud to say that he is a member of the Searle Executive Board. Needless to say, his expertise in uh, all matters, uh, military uh, and uh, foreign relations around military matters um, needs no explanation. So if the panelists will please turn on their cameras, we will begin our discussion. Very good. So I want to begin with uh, General Votel. Uh, it seems increasingly likely that sanctions are not going to deter Russia from its campaign to take over Ukraine. As the increase in troops and ever deadlier weaponry attests, Putin will likely stop at nothing until Russia is firmly, uh, until Ukraine is firmly in Russian control. So an initial question that I wanted to ask you is, what would it take to get Russia to relinquish its hold on Ukraine, in your opinion, from the standpoint of a military campaign? Now, I know the issue of nuclear escalation will hover in the background here, but if you just help us think through the current position uh, of uh, the Russian assault and the current military power of Ukraine by comparison, uh, where are Russia's points of vulnerability and, um, and what do you think would actually defeat Russia militarily? Yeah, thanks, Claire, and, and I'm very glad to be part of the panel here. So I think that's a great, great question, good place to start this. So, you know, I think if you look at the advantages of what Russia, the Russian military forces have, certainly have the, there is a quality in mass that they are, that they are able to bring to bear. This is a big army. It has a lot of equipment, a lot of it, a modernized equipment, uh, and, you know, has, uh, has, has all the organizational structure that you would expect of a, of a big army. So, you know, their big advantage is this is this ability to bring this mass to bear on on the on Ukrainian forces, which are, you know, not without capabilities, but certainly, um, at least on paper, don't look to be uh, an equivalent to uh, to the Russian Federation forces. 
but the but it it is it appears as we've kind of seen over the last uh, couple of weeks here that what the Russians are running into is they're running into a very very strong resistance, uh, probably a resistance they did not expect. I I, I have to believe their their uh, plan called for them to very quickly move to uh, key population areas, take control, uh, and that this would be a much uh, much faster campaign for them. But it has been anything but that. Uh, and and so what, what the, the advantages of the Ukrainians right now, certainly the leadership that is being exerted by uh, Mr. Zelensky, President Zelensky, is motivating them. It's really uh, aided in their morale. And, and that it is a nation at arms uh, and uh, almost 100% uh, unified uh, against uh, this, this Russian, uh, Russian invasion. And, and we've seen this with citizens uh, flocking to the civilian defense corps and, and and forces here to augment the military force. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, that even even if the Russian juggernaut, if the if the this mass is able to move in and occupy the cities and things like this, there is going to be a significant resistance effort uh, uh, by the by the Ukrainians, uh, you know, that are that will continue to continue to be in the area, and this will be the biggest vulnerability that the Russians will take. So, you know, when you look at what will cause the Russians to really uh, change change their strategy here. It doesn't appear. I mean, even with the very devastating financial sanctions, with the um with the condemnation of virtually everybody in around the world uh, and uh, this massive effort to support the Ukrainians. This has not yet deterred them, uh, but what probably will deter them is, is a long struggle uh, and a, you know, a so-called death of a thousand cuts here at the hands of a very motivated, capable, uh, and, and what seems to be a well-organized uh, Ukrainian resistance uh, will ultimately do it. The, the bad part of that is it's gonna take time to get there uh, for something like that. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll have to see. We're only a couple of weeks into this where it goes, but uh, it appears that uh, that Mr. Putin, despite all of this, has not yet been, not been, been effectively deterred. If uh, Ukraine were a NATO country, um, most commentators that I that I hear discussing this have little doubt that we would be engaging directly militarily. That's, of course, part of the NATO compact, Article 5 of the NATO agreement. If we imagine, for example, this kind of onslaught, and, and perhaps Putin would never have invaded had Ukraine been a NATO country, um, but what would be the military tactics we would be taking under these circumstances to try to defeat Russia militarily? Well, uh, I mean, I, you know, I think there's a variety of different things we could do. Certainly, I think one of the things that we would want to be able to do is really uh, go after cutting off Russia's ability to make war. Um, that is, you know, further decimating their supply chains. The Ukrainians in, in Ukraine seem to be doing a pretty effective job of that right now with the with their own tools and the tools that are being provided to them by NATO and a, and a variety of other um, international partners out there. Um, so, so cutting them off, going after their command and control um, and uh, and then going after the, 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 the key systems that that uh, that allow them to uh, propagate terror on the on the Ukrainian people. I mean that that's that's what I think it would look like. Uh, um, um, certainly, you know, getting dominance in the air would be an important aspect of this. That, that there's no doubt about that. That is that is clearly part of our doctrine uh, in terms of doing that. And then, of course, bringing all of the other aspects to bear. I mean, and this is we're in the 21st century. This is we need to think about information warfare, the use of uh, Cyber, our cyber capabilities to diminish their abilities to command and control to do the things that they need to do. So all of this will be brought to bear. Uh, the the consequences and the, and I think what you, what you, we would look at here would be would be a very very significant combat on a scale that we we have not seen. Um, for quite some time, um, and uh, so I, I think uh, you know it, it would it would it would be very it would be very 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 brutal, and uh, uh, and it would be all encompassing. Let me ask you a, a final sort of general question. Then I wanted to get into some of the details and invite our other panelists. And in. um, 
what is the, of course, the great fear here is of nuclear escalation, escalation to the point of a nuclear exchange. How afraid do you think we should be of that possibility? Uh, many of the things that we're going to talk about, uh, transfer of, of fighter jets uh, to Ukraine, uh, protecting humanitarian corridors, um, uh, and so on, how much we're willing to engage depends very much on how what we think the likelihood is of escalation to the point of a nuclear exchange. Uh, huh. And then on the other hand, of course, Putin gets to wield his nuclear club um, and make threats <laughs> that may or may not be credible to, uh, to keep uh, NATO countries from reacting. So just your thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. And I mean, my, my, my experience is I think you have to I think you have to respect your adversaries and the capabilities they have and the and their ability to bring those capabilities to bear. Um, I, I think everybody recognizes that Russia has nuclear capability. Um, uh, and and by all apparent, you know, at least open source uh, information, they have they have the ability to to employ that um, and employ it with some kind of devastating effect. So we have to we have to we, we we can't put that to the side when we make decisions about what we are doing in this particular conflict. Um, so you, you, you can, I don't think you can keep those two things independent. We have to we have to think through those those aspects of it now. Um, whether you know whether we would reach a point where it would trigger the uh, Mr. Putin's use of this. Uh, I, I you know th th that that's something to matter. Again, we have to understand exactly how he's his decision making calculus. And I would suggest to you that what we have seen and what we have heard uh, by pundits and other experts uh, on this. And, I, and I'll throw myself into this. When someone asks me, do you think they'll do this? No, I don't think they'll do this. I don't see how it's in his interest. Guess where we are two and a half weeks later now. It it, it apparently is in his interest. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we, uh, we have to really calculate uh, his decision-making, uh, you know, capacity at this particular point, and and how he is going through all of that, and and he is demonstrating that he is willing to take an extraordinary amount of risk for this operation, uh, and that has to be included into our into our decision making. So let me let me switch now to some more specific topics, and then I'm going to get our other panelists in uh, to to talk about the legal sides and. Uh, by the way, what I should have said and, and promised I would say and forgot was that everyone here is appearing in their personal capacity, uh, so no one representing any organization. Uh, we have assembled several experts, but of course, um, uh, no one speaks for that organization, and um, uh, we have uh, one member of the panel who is active duty military does not speak for the U.S. military. Um, let's talk about the fighter jet situation. So, as you mentioned, Joe, the... Um, a possibility of supremacy, air, air, establishing air supremacy is really critical to Ukraine's defense. And indeed, uh, a fair bit of the um, attacks on civilians are coming from the air as well. So there are humanitarian reasons, uh, in addition to military tactical reasons, to try to gain control of the air. And um, the um, U.S. and other NATO uh, partners have been unwilling to establish the no-fly zone that President Zelensky has been requesting. Um, however, uh, several countries are very happy to supply the kind of fighter jets that, uh, that Ukraine needs, but those in particular in Polish hands, uh, which are the former Soviet-style um, fighter MiG fighter jets that uh, the Ukrainian pilots are able to fly. However, nobody wants to be the one to transfer them to Ukraine. So we are in a kind of standoff. Um, Poland, uh, the other yesterday, I think, made the surprising suggestion that they would transfer them to U.S. air bases in uh, Germany, and then the U.S. would convey them to Ukraine, and the U.S. has said, no dice, we're not going to do that. What do we do in this situation? 
Well, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting issue here. I, I think it's really important first and foremost, as we talk about these kind of things is make sure we separate the things we're talking about. We're talking about the provision of aircraft to the Ukrainians uh, that they can employ themselves. And then another topic we're talking about is this no fly zone. These really are two different things and the ramifications for, for both of them are, are, are different. And we have to look at it in, 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 in that regard, you know, with respect to uh, the Megs for um, for the Ukraine, uh, you know, I, I, it appears to me that there was a discussion ongoing about this, and we were there, people were looking for a way to maybe move forward with this. And then, with the uh, you know, maybe the premature announcements in the last couple of days by uh, by uh, the Polish authorities, they got out and front of people and then nobody felt comfortable about what was being thrown out there and and it kind of it kind of uh, stopped stopped work on that um, I, I think it's really important that we uh, continue to uh, make sure that the Ukrainians have the capabilities they need I think in the against the backdrop of this I think it's important to recognize that there are there is a, a massive effort underway by the United States and by our NATO partners and EU and and perhaps others here here to move equipment into Ukraine. And that is actually taking place. That's been reported. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, US reporters on the ground reporting on that, and, and we've had reports on that. That's continuing. And that is providing critical capabilities, things like stingers, things like these uh, Javelin missiles that have been so effective against tanks and armored personnel carriers and, and uh, Russian trucks and other things like that that have had a, had a, had a, had a significant capability. I think what there has been a discussion on it is that you know, the, 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 the potential risk of, of, of introducing aircraft may bring this to another level of escalation. And, and I think that's what's being debated uh, in terms of this. Uh, the other aspect of this, of course, is that the, will this significantly uh, improve the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces ability to do what they're doing? Um, they have, they already have MiGs. They're apparently retained some of that capability. So I, I think the judgments that you've seen uh, coming from our military and perhaps from the intelligence community is that the 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 uh, the impact of giving them additional aircraft will, will have a nominal impact on their effectiveness, frankly, at this particular point. And that right now it may be more important to get these other pieces of equipment in there. These are these are likely the discussions that, that are taking place. And I'm not bad advocating one thing or another. I do recognize, however, that the provision of aircraft from a NATO country or an EU country to uh, the Ukraine carries with it a, a moral and a, and a morale boosting effect right here that demonstrates very, very clearly that, uh, that uh, the, the international community is behind uh, the Ukrainians and we shouldn't underestimate that as well. So in my estimation, all of those things are, are at play in this. And, and, uh, and I think what you're seeing is I think you're trying to see a very careful uh, decision process and discussion process to make Make sure that we get Ukraine what they need without escalating this out of our control and, and, and entering into the unanticipated risk uh, uh, area. Yeah, so this brings us to the a really important topic of co-belligerency, right? Because um, Poland is afraid to convey the um, MiG fighters because they are afraid of being targetable uh, by Russia for crossing the line into engagement and hostilities. And the US, frankly, um, may have exactly the same concerns. Every other country is gonna have the same concerns. So how we solve this practically is one issue, but let's look at some of the legal issues uh, connected with that. And, and Mary Ellen, why don't I ask you to, to jump in for a minute and tell us a, a little bit your thoughts about code belligerency. I mean, is Poland right to worry that they would be co-belligerents if they were to directly transfer the uh, the planes to Ukraine, and you're muted. Yeah, I think General Vodel's already spoken um, to that point that we need to exercise a great deal of prudence. I think President Biden has been clear about what he doesn't will not want to risk. Maybe Claire, I can add something more though on the legal aspects of co belligerence. Yes. Um, because I think that's there's some real there's some real misunderstanding here, and maybe we can we can sort it out a little bit because we uh, since we've got this expertise. Um, let's be absolutely clear: the 
perpetrator of one of the greatest violations of international law of all time is Russia in invading Ukraine and attempting to eliminate a sovereign nation. Ukraine has the clear right under the United Nations Charter of acting in its own self-defense, and it has more. It has the right to act in collective self-defense. So every country in the world has a right to join in Ukraine in the actual fighting. And that has serious implications for what else countries are permitted to do. What countries are not allowed to do and what they must actively avoid doing is giving any assistance to Russia. So we, we already see that Belarus is in complete complicity, giving its territory, aiding in this act of aggression. Other countries have a duty to make sure they're not assisting as well. So let's take Turkey, which believes for some reason that it has a duty of neutrality to keep the straits um, to the Black Sea open. I don't agree with that. I believe it is directly part of Russia's military engagement, its military strategy to use the straits to get, and I think that Turkey has a duty not to fight with Ukraine, but to close those straits. Now let's talk about planes. Every state which has a right to aid in the um, uh, fighting can certainly give uh, equipment. But if they send their own personnel to deliver that equipment or to engage in uh, no-fly zones or other acts that have a kinetic aspect to them in the fighting, they will be targetable under international humanitarian law. It's not that they don't have the right to do it, but are they being prudent in that level of engagement. So let's be clear. Could I add one last point? I don't mean yeah, to go sure. on, but I think the, the critical issue of the moment is not the straits uh, that Turkey controls to the Black Sea, but oil. Oil is the big issue that in international law we're grappling with right now. I believe it's absolutely clear that as with giving uh, military equipment, there is a right to cut off oil, is there a duty to do so? Oil is to me somewhere between engaging in the fighting and closing the strait, or and closing the straits, which would be an act of assistance. Right. But we so, know, so, so could, actually, let, let me, me just hold off on the oil thing. Because well, let that. me just say, let me just say why, because it goes to your very first point to General Vodal that um, sanctions aren't working, and. It, it's actually, we could, we could move this thing, this fight far faster from all the Russia experts uh, that I've heard if oil if it is cut by the Europeans soon. Well, and, and, and I myself have a... So uh, I don't, I, I think it's an open question. Just exactly that. With, yeah, it's uh, an open legal question, whether the, whether the Europeans don't have a duty to follow the United States and cut oil because of its clear link to Russia's ability to wage this war, at the very least, they have the right to do it and they should do it. Okay, so hang on on the oil bit. Okay, let's go back to the planes. This is really, really critical. Um, yeah, if you have a little bit of a different view, I think on co-belligerency. I mean, um, you know, Mary Ellen is saying, if I understand that transfer of any significant military equipment um, makes you a co-belligerent, I take, an, Sorry, no, I didn't say that. You can transfer equipment as long as you don't engage your own personnel in any um, uh, actual fighting. And that would be understood to have U.S. pilots, for example, fly the planes into, um, uh, or Polish pilots, fly the planes into Ukraine. Into but Ukraine, delivering but the planes, totally having Ukrainian pilots come and fly them out of out Poland would be a different matter. Yeah, so I, I would argue to the Russians that that is not co-belligerent. Leave the keys in the ignition and leave the motor running and, you know, go take a coffee break and let the Ukrainian pilots come pick it up. Yev, let me turn to you. And by the way, for those of you who do not know, um, Colonel Yev Vindman is originally from Ukraine. Uh, he and his twin brother came to the United States when they were very little, I think, or, or rather young. Um, and, uh, and so, of course, uh, he knows a lot about Ukraine as well as uh, all matters uh, military. Claire, yeah. so uh, we were both little and young. 
<laughs> um, when we came. Yeah. We were, we were uh, four years old, but uh, I think Mary um, Ellen has a, um, raises some, some very interesting points about what our duties are, what all countries' duties are related to um, um, restricting or blocking uh, Russian uh, aggression. But the law, uh, what we're, we're talking about here is really the law of neutrality. And tied with that is co this concept of co-belligerency. So the law of neutrality stems from the Hague Conventions uh, signed in 1907, predating both world wars and the UN Charter. And it's frankly unclear. There is a lot of discussion about whether the law of neutrality applies, whether there has to be a formal declaration of war. And we have to remember that the Russians declared this a military technical operation, so they never declared war on Ukraine. So, you know, a, a strict uh, sort of construction view is that, well, there may be no war. I don't know that I necessarily buy that. There's clearly an international armed conflict, but the law of neutrality is still very unclear. And the law of neutrality grants to neutral countries certain rights and obligations. And um, the rights are basically that their, their territory is invaluable. And the obligations are to be generally neutral, which is composed of a number of factors, but one of them is impartiality. And I would say that right now we are clearly not, the, the West is not impartial. Most of the world is not impartial. I think 141 uh, countries condemned uh, Russia's actions in the UN General Assembly last week. 35, um, 35 uh, abstained and, and I guess maybe five uh, voted in, in support. So um, the impartiality is just is non-existent. In addition to uh, the fact that we're provide um, we're uh, we've got significant sanctions along with the West, and we're already transferring a number of weapon systems to right. Ukraine. So so yeah. So that's the issue, right? So given that we're already transferring stingers and javelins and so on, so what's the difference if we transfer some planes? Right? Well, that's, and why are that's, we all hung up on this when every second counts for Ukraine? That, that's an excellent point. And so this is where the law, um, you, you have to look at the law and then you look at the policy and risks associated with it. So um, the law also talks about this concept of co-belligerency. And so even if you have a technical violation of this uh, impartiality aspect of neutrality, that doesn't necessarily take you. And there's been some cases in, in National Court of Justice that indicate that you have to have a much greater level of participation before you are considered a co-belligerent. So providing weapons historically uh, has not been considered co-belligerency, but the, the party that gets to make that call is the aggrieved party. So in this case, the Russians are the ones that decide when they think that we've crossed the level of co-belligerency. So and let's look at the second aspect. Moment for me to get Harvey in here, because while Harvey is also- Can, can I lawyer, take another 30 seconds and just mention uh, uh, one more thing? It better be about the plane, okay. otherwise hold off. Yeah, so so the, the short answer is, this is now a, a risk analysis. Qualitatively, there's really no major difference between uh, the planes that are already in theater. Ukrainians have those very same planes. We're providing more of them. It's the same thing as us providing more javelins and stingers. They already have those. We're providing more of them. So that doesn't change the nature of the conflict. So, so we're, not, it's we're not supplying them with a nuclear weapon. Exactly. Yeah. And, and whether we supply them with, with uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles, that is still of the same quality of uh, uh, armaments that the Ukrainians already have. So All right, I'll, I'll Harvey, leave it at that. Over to you. Harvey, you are, in addition to being a lawyer, you are a capacious thinker about international relations. And um, one of the things that you and I have been talking about is, you know, you have to think about this from Putin's mindset. And uh, so this is the perfect moment for you to give us some thoughts about, you know, how would Putin regard the transfer of uh, of these um, MiG planes, and and uh, do do we take the risk to do it? Should the U.S. do it? You're on mute. Yes, thank you. All right. First of all, it's great to be with this bunch of extraordinary people. So, and I associate myself with all of their comments. And what I think is intriguing is. The real, as you pointed out, um, 
clear. The real dilemma is, can the West save Ukraine without starting a war with Russia? I mean, th that's the, the core issue, I think. And then these, um, and I, I, I commend to you a recent piece by Janice Stein, an old teacher of mine from the Monk Institute in the uh, Foreign Affairs. That's the actual title of her piece. And th the logic is, I, as you saw Mary shake her head, I would say in an east-west direction, when Yev said, um, it's the Russians are gonna decide what a co-belligerence is. And, I think Mary, right? Mary appropriately says, Mary Ellen, it's yeah. Clear call. It's, it, this is the, what we've, uh, the body of international law has generated what the parameters are. And we all agree as international lawyers. The problem is, I don't think Putin's gone to law school. So that's sort of the, the, the problematic, which is that I will bring the, the famous Thucydides issue into play. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. And he has demonstrated that he has no respect for international law. He's demonstrated that he has gone into Ukraine with his own self-definition of the relationship of the Ukraine to Russia. The only people who will find that convincing is Putin in his definition. And we are now left with what is the appropriate response to how does this thing end? We can we can negotiate these issues that on the tactical level, but strategically level, what is the West's strategic position as to what they will tolerate with an ending? And are they willing to tolerate uh, the removal of Ukraine as an independent entity? As, Judge, as General Votel pointed out, good luck to you, Putin, trying to exercise that space given the unknowns of the resistance. Uh, he, like us, experienced the problem of occupying or trying to build an Afghanistan. We have that in recent history. This has not been a great time for occupiers in the modern age. That will be his decision and choice. Our two issues are, one, it's the shelling issue. Do we have a way of avoiding this escalating to nuclear war? And what are we making clear to Mr. Putin, what our red lines are. Right. Are the red lines that if he uses chemical weapons, we will find that unacceptable and we will decide that triggers uh, an intervention by the West? Are we saying to him, if you move into NATO, that will trigger, as you said, Article 5, and we will respond in the way General Votel said right, we have the power to do? Are we comfortable with what that means for escalation. We've had comments in the, our old friend, um, uh, uh, Janoff, uh, where, where is it, um, has said, can the United Nations pass a resolution in which we, Jonathan Janoff, in which we make it clear that we're taking nuclear weapons off the table? Would the Russians support that as a resolution in some way from the Security Council? Uh, our friend, Sean Powers from Click here has pointed out, we haven't started really the cyber issue. Uh, General Votes, uh, what's going to be our response if that starts happening? What so are the red we, lines that we're putting forward? I, I think you're absolutely right that the U.S. has not clarified its red lines and, and NATO has not either. And um, and, and this is um, a difficulty because I don't know if we can clarify but you're absolutely right to point to the um, the risk that Putin will use uh, chemical weapons uh, in Ukraine. And we're getting some uh, reports of intelligence assessments that he may be preparing to do so. And uh, we also have a report yesterday that the uh, attack on the um, hospital uh, that occurred two days ago was the result of the use of a thermobaric uh, weapon, yep. which is Let's sort hear. of... I think we have made red lines. The president said we will not put troops on the ground. That's a red line. And he also has said that we're going to use economic sanctions and forms of sanctions in order to penalize him. So then it becomes the question, we, we created those red lines, how Putin concludes and interprets what those economic sanctions are doing. And as Mary raised, which we sort of tabled, if it starts really affecting the oil issue, 
And third parties like China have to make a decision on what their decision will be, or Turkey, we will then be moving down a sequence of events that we may lose control of in an escalatory manner. And then the question is, what is the West, us and NATO, truly prepared to do to project Mary's expertise, projection of force, and at what level in order to stand by what we think the end game should be? And then the last question I would pose before I give up the floor is, what does this group think are the off-ramps? In the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had an off-ramp, which was the private negotiations between the Russians and us. I think we have established some, but what are the off-ramps that stop that? Now, is giving the poles, letting the Ukrainian pilots fly the planes into Ukraine, for is that gonna be an escalatory or an off-ramp reaction? We'll have to wait and see as what Putin, how he would interpret those actions. Over. Well, so, so let me try to get some, some to smoke you folks out a little bit more with more answers than questions, right? Because everybody, everybody is turning to you. Uh, well, and to the we're all professors, so we're happy to ask questions. Give yeah. Some answers here. And so let's talk about the use of forbidden weapons. Um, we uh, were willing to shell uh, cruise rockets down on uh, Syria for use of uh, chemical weapons. Uh, and here we have the possibility that Putin may use chemical weapons in Ukraine. And the, and the thermobaric or hyperbaric uh, weapon that he used uh, just a few days ago is clearly a, a forbidden uh, weapon in its strength and in the fact that it's mostly used, I understand, to target civilian populations. Um, so, um, uh, General Votel, maybe you can say uh, a few words about your, your thoughts about uh, using forbidden weaponry and should uh, NATO allies be prepared to respond if, for example, there's a use of chemical weapons? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely do. And, and you know, having was being our commander at the time when we did take strikes against Syria as a result of the use of chemicals against our own uh, their own the citizens. Um, uh, the decision making around that in 2016 or 2017 and 2018 was quite uh, was quite rapid and quite decisive. And I think that's exactly the way you have to be um, uh, with this. So yes, I, I do think we have to think through these types of these types of uh, of, uh, of options and, and make sure we're, we are we are in fact prepared to respond uh, with this. Uh, if, you know, again, these are deliberate decisions on the behalf of NATO, uh, stepping outside of their Article Five and other things. But you know, NATO has made decisions to 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 do outside of Article Five uh, operations in the past, uh, and so uh, they certainly ought to be thinking about this as well. So, so you think that it is not beyond the. Uh, pale, not beyond contemplation, uh, that the U.S. or NATO allies should consider direct military intervention in response to the use of uh, chemical weapons. Well, again, I think those decisions have to be made by authorities, but I think it's 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 an obligation. I think to make sure we're prepared so that our so that our authority, our civilian authorities, have the option of responding to that if that supports our overall policy. Um, again, and there, there's ramifications to all of this. I, I'm 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 not a big uh, I'm not a big fan of making a lot of red lines here, saying hey we're going to do this or we're going to do that. I, I do like the idea a little bit of strategic ambiguity and keeping people guessing. And one of the ways that we add strength to that is by making sure that we are prepared to respond. So I, I do think this is an, uh, something we should certainly be paying attention to. And again, we have to respect our adversary, even if it's Mr. Putin, uh, and, uh, and, and what he might do uh, that would, that would uh, you know, cause us to respond. Mary Ellen, is there some um, irony, perhaps, it, it, in the thought that perhaps uh, NATO and, and the U.S. would be prepared to use force uh, if a chemical attack were to occur, but that we would not do so for humanitarian reasons. Do you have any, any thoughts about that and, and any legal aspects of that decision? Absolutely. Uh, let me first associate myself with General Bodel's red lines are really tricky business. I, I wish I don't want to. And, and when we start singling out chemical weapons, then why not thermobaric? Why not uh, bombing 
civilian escape routes. There, there are so many atrocities happening already it, it, to, to try to single out one type of weapon. Um, but let me also respond to something that, that Harvey said before I give my actual answer to what, what do we do if, if, uh, if this goes on with more uh, forbidden weapons, prohibited weapons. Harvey made the point that Putin doesn't care about international law. That's clear, but we should. We're in this fight because we stand for the rule of law in the world. And that means we need to stand by the rule of law. We cannot be using military force or taking steps that would visibly violate the rules that we say we're trying to defend. Sadly, we don't have the best record. And part of what I think we're going to uh, uh, need to correct going forward, if we're gonna to get to a better place post this horrific invasion, is for there to be some reconciliation about the US's own, at times, arrogant positions of being in a superior place to call, uh, to call the exception that we got special treatment. We need a Mary reset. Ellen, you know what? Hold on that one second. I promise I'll give you the floor back, but I just want to give Harvey a chance to respond to that because I actually think the last thing you said might be something he agrees with. Um, let me raise the following, which um, may be uncomfortable for everyone. Um, I understand the resistance that many policy leaders have for red lines and the attractiveness that we have for, quote, strategic ambivalence or strategic ambiguity. That doctrine is helping to contribute to the deaths of many Ukrainians. And the more we are strategically ambiguous about as China watches what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis our commitments, in, which results in a bully going forward, um, I know, Mary, this upsets you, but an appeasement, the Sudetenland, we, th this level of appeasement that Chamberlain went through resulted in massive, massive deaths for a descent of when do you want to stop someone? Oh, please, and you if know, we, if we Harvey, make, I, I'm not appeasing anybody. Well, well, don't associate question, that with me, please. Okay, so but, but I am is, saying let's talk about 2022. And look, my, my position is that the worst crime has already been committed and it's leading to these ongoing crimes. And that was the act of aggression. That was the invasion. I think all of our focus needs to be on what will end this war, free Ukraine of Russian aggression and occupation without engaging in a nuclear exchange or even a horrific direct exchange. Uh, General Vodal already set us off on that important point. And one of the things that we can do is strictly comply with uh, international law. So we keep this global coalition in support. Remember, we've done this before. We did it successfully once before when we liberated Kuwait. It was a very different military adversary. But remember, part of the reason we got unanimity on the Security Council, including with the Soviet Union, was because we were citing and remaining strictly in compliance with international law. Before sanctions came in, we had Security Council authorization for that. We won mm -hmm. that fight and liberated so, Kuwait in 100 hours of combat. I think there's no second guessing that we stay, and sadly, I, I'm gonna be critical of myself and others, we have not clarified and, and this country has not led in strict compliance with the rule of law. We need to get back to that. So let's end the aggression. Let's do what it takes. Let's let's use our diplomacy to get our uh, the other oil buying countries in the world to take the sacrifice now and cut their supplies so that and cut their purchases so that we don't have to look at these risks of chemical weapons, of nuclear weapons, of thermobaric weapons being used. To me, we need to do everything short that prevents those kind of We're catastrophic that escalation. Harvey, brief response, and then I want to get Yev in, who's been. So I, I'm very sympathetic to the the problem set, but I see it as follows: If it's not clear to Putin and ourselves what the end game is, in other words, are the panelists willing to say we would happily or not we will we will live with a Russian Ukraine 
in which there is no exchanges of, we avoid a nuclear war, but we let, the, we let Putin figure out how he's gonna ingest the Ukraine. And he stops there for his satisfaction. If the answer is no, Mary Ellen, what are you willing to do to maintain an independent Ukraine? How far? Harvey, that's a, that's a false dichotomy. Yeah. It's not an either or. We, we don't have to risk nuclear war in order to uh, support and continue to defend Ukraine. They are doing a great job. They are amazing in their resistance. But remember, one of the clear implications of, of aggression is that there's non-recognition. We've never recognized the um, occupation and annexation of Crimea, and we will never recognize, the international community needs to never recognize the results of aggression. We need to continue to support Ukraine's independence regardless of whether they begin to lose the military contest on the ground. It may so take, me, it may I, take I, generations, but it's not a question of risking nuclear war or no Ukraine. All right, let me get Yevin now and, and ask, go back to our topic of chemical weapons. Yev, if Putin uses chemical weapons in Ukraine, do we take military action at that point or not? You're on mute. That's more of a policy question than a legal question, but I, I will say just a, a couple of thoughts on other weapons that have been mentioned. The thermal barracks, thermal barracks are not a prohibited weapon. Neither by some, um, by some nations, neither are cluster munitions. I understand that there are, um, there are some international protocols and treaties that uh, many company, uh, countries have banned, but not all of them have necessarily taken that perspective. Yeah. And so we have to look at this from a Russian perspective. Um, I don't necessarily dis uh, believe that they completely disagree or, or don't believe in international law because they did attempt, however flimsy it was, to make a pretext for their uh, attack on Ukraine. Um, that demonstrates that they at least wanted to make a colorable argument uh, that they were in compliance with some version. Thermobarics are, are completely legal weapons used in a legal way. I think the issue is how the, the Russians may be using them, violating principles of distinction and proportionality, uh, not necessarily that the weapon system itself is, is uh, illegal. For example, glass bullets are known as chemical weapons. Those are legal weapons but not necessarily thermal barracks. Um, right, okay. and, and, and partly they're a little bit too new, I take it, for the uh, international community to have come to a distinct consensus on that. The U.S. Sure, has, had, we, the US has had actually used uh, thermal barracks in combat. We, we, we have, uh, we've used fuel air explosives. Yeah, fuel air bombs, that's the same thing as... as uh, I think they should be unlawful, sure. just for the record. Yeah, I, I disagree. And I, I think this, this is a fundamental point, very important point to make is that the Russians, and I, I was listening to the, the U.S. Army or the U.S. Department of Defense Cyber, Cybercom Conference, and um, I've, I've pulled up the article, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But the gentleman, Oxford professor, has an interesting argument that he makes is that the law, um, the law as being um, perceived is aggravating the conflict because what happens is based on our understanding of the law of armed conflict, um, Vladimir Putin is taking advantage of the seams. And so I think over the course of the last 20 years, there's been an effort by very smart people, people with their heart in the right place to restrict the law of war to, for instance, we should only be dropping precision guided munitions in, um, in armed conflict. We should eliminate all almost all civilian casualties, but that's not necessarily the state of the law. And we have to be cognizant of what the state of the law actually is and not necessarily what is uh, proposed by uh, non-governmental. So the, the law is created by governments, right? So uh, the ICRC uh, statement of law, uh, law professor's view of the law is not the state of the law as necessarily acknowledged by the US government or the Russian government for that matter. Yeah, but I think I need so. to jump in here 
and make a comment, which is that Putin cares about international law a little bit the way a, a taxidermist loves animals, right? Stuffed and mounted on the wall. So I'm not sure that, you know, the fact that he gives a, a, a thin argument, um, which is transparently false for justifying the invasion of, of Ukraine on international law grounds is, is but um, I take your point that at least he's paying lip service to some of these norms. I know that General Votel may have to leave us a little bit earlier than the other panelists, so I want to, you're, you're good actually, okay. So let me get back to you. I want to now address the issue of humanitarian corridors. Um, so one thing that's happened in the last week is that there have been several attempts to negotiate ceasefires to get um, uh, civilians out of Ukraine and uh, the Russians have violated those agreements on several occasions and have actually shelled these supposedly safe exit corridors. Um, do you see, Joe, any way for um, NATO countries uh, to try to police those corridors? If, if we can't establish a no-fly zone uh, because it's too escalatory, is there any way that we could take um, UN forces or a, a peace, an ad hoc peacekeeping force, um, perhaps of neutral non-NATO countries, um, to come in and uh, police those routes to try to get uh, more refugees out of Ukraine. Well, yeah, yeah that, certainly there are there are things that could be done. Uh, you know, in the United Nations is a good approach, and and maybe countries uh, that that would step forward and form a form a, a, a coalition of purpose here to go in and, and focus specifically on those and make it very clear in terms of what they're doing and conduct their operations in a, in a way that was really focused on that. There are certainly some uh, some things that, uh, that, 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 that could be done, um, you know, in terms of that. Um, so yeah, I guess the answer to the question is yes, there, there certainly, there certainly can be, I don't, I don't know if that is actually being contemplated at this particular point, but, uh, maybe, but there certainly are some things that could be done. The international negotiation and coordination machinery doesn't move very quickly. And here we have a situation in Ukraine that is evolving by the minute. Um, with, it, it's hard to imagine things can get worse, but they can, uh, and there can be um, massive attacks on uh, civilians. Um, you know, how can we move more quickly to try to marshal any resources that we have in the international community um, to, uh, to address uh, the humanitarian uh, disaster that is, is looming? Do you see, um, General Votel, anything that the international um, sort of uh, uh, international negotiators or, or military community can do quickly to address these issues? Well, you know, I, I, first off, I, I get, having is having not actually been in in Poland and in the areas around here to see exactly what is taking place here. I mean, I'm I'm looking at this as most of our listeners are are, are looking at this as well. But it does seem that there is a fairly significant international effort and an effort, certainly by the countries around here, to um, to, uh, to 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 help people get out of there and then certainly once they get to the border to get them get them taken care of that's a that is a that's a huge um aspect of this you know i think there certainly are maybe some things from a united nations standpoint uh, this may be a way of of trying to uh, to approach this um through you know unhcr and some others here of trying to uh, trying to to you know, create some kind of resolution that establishes some very specific areas. We have actually done this in places not always successfully in the former Yugoslavia and other places of of, uh, of places as safe zones uh, for people that that can be done. But again, all of this you have to be prepared to uh, you have to be prepared to take action to protect that if that's not the case. So there still is a need to to do something like that. Although in that case, you know, the, the it's a it's a little bit a little bit more clear. So yes, I, I think there certainly are some things that we can we can do in this regard uh, to, to help uh, 
people, um, you know, would get out of there, and uh, and then once they're out of there, get get settled in. I, I you know, as as horrible as the situation is for the Ukrainians, this is not the worst situation we've seen with with uh, humanitarian uh, disasters like this. You look back at the heartbreaking images coming out of Syria in the twenty. 11, 2012. This was a this was a much more uh, significant problem. I mean, we have actually people polls, you know, greeting Ukrainians at the border and bringing them in. At that at that point, you had not only people trying to escape conflict, but then trying to, you know, trying to fight to get into places where they could be safe. Um, so, you know, easing those types of things, uh, making it easy for those countries to take that, and then some burden sharing here would go a long way, I think, in terms of taking care of people. That's very helpful. Harvey, can you say a little bit about uh, your, your thoughts about what is Putin getting out of these de deliberate attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure? I mean, it is if, you know, that and taking over nuclear power plants and uh, using hyperbaric weapons and possibly using chemical weapons, if he doesn't want NATO in the fight, why is he doing this? It seems to be so, a hoarding yeah. disaster from his perspective. So I think I uh... One cannot estimate, underestimate his desire for fear. And I think his estimation is that if you do these things, will this result in the Ukrainians giving up quicker and faster? Or is it a misperception that this will only re-intensify their resistance? So that, that's sort of the gamble when you do this. Uh, second of all, when we have to do the investigation of what really transpired, are these actions by commanders in the field, or has this been a sign off by Putin himself as the commander in chief to make pick these targets and let these targets be taken in order to break the resolve of the Ukrainian people? Though, uh, though I would say the other comment I would make is that, remember, they used to be a nuclear power at Ukraine. And those nuclear weapons were removed from their geographical territory. And one of the lessons that I think one is learning from the last 25 years of the West's interaction in a variety of uh, projections of force is that if you're a nuclear power, you have a lot more maneuverability. And this is sort of now we have to think through in Pax Americana whether this um, lesson to be learned by the Iranians and other countries, that the one way to stop other countries from violating your territory for their own interests is that if you've gone nuclear. So I'm kind of concerned about the consequences. And if he continues to target civilians in clear violations of law of armed conflict, and our reaction is hand, hand wringing, I put it to the panel, what lesson will he learn from that? I agree right. with Mary. The key thing is make turn Russia into a pariah state. Got it. Really critical. But if we corner a pariah state, I think it's imperative that we think of off ramps that we have to give him in order for us to de-escalate and not escalate it. If even our pariah strategy is successful, a cornered rat is a very, very dangerous animal. And as Putin gets more cornered and has grandeurs of the great Russian empire, that makes me a little bit nervous and concerned over. Let's do one last topic before we let the audience questions in, which I will, which I will read momentarily, um, but fairly quickly. So we've got reports of about 16,000 um, foreign fighters streaming into Ukraine to assist. Um, I've seen a few uh, reports on Twitter of individual foreign fighters going to, to help Russia, but not many. Um, now there's some, you know, history for this. We've seen this uh, before. Um, and uh, yet it, the complications associated with it are potentially endless. So uh, about 3,000 Americans is the estimate have gone over to fight in Ukraine and pretty soon we'll start learning of, of um, fatalities, presumably, and, and Americans who are captured. Um, so question, what is the status going to be of those foreign fighters? Uh, the official Russian communiques have uh, put out that they are going to re regard foreign fighters as war criminals, potentially. 
at the very least they're going to see them as mercenaries but they'll refuse to see them as regular combatants um Harvey, I know you have a lot of thoughts about this. I'm going to come back to you in just a minute. Let me first ask um, uh, General Votel and, and Mary Ellen to weigh in on this. Uh, and then as convening authority, I know you're going to have a lot to say on this. So I'll, I'll, I'll go first and, and be brief here. I, I mean, I, 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 I watched this with some concern. I, I, I recognize these are, for the most part, people who have some allegiance or uh, some relationship or to some degree or feel or feel very strongly about this and are going to help the Ukrainians. And they're, they're, I guess there is a certain nobleness in that. I think, uh, I think the way that they are integrated and brought into this, I think, is really important. I, I think... Uh, to the extent that uh, that these fighters, if they're going to continue to do that, they can be uh, brought into some type of legitimate organization and legitimate status within the existing forces, whether it's the Ukrainian military or whether it's the recognized civil defense forces, I think that is a, that is a good place for them to be. And uh, I think that it would be in Ukraine's benefit to do that uh, down the line so that there aren't a lot of other you know, and I'm not say, suggesting there may be, uh, but there there aren't a lot of loose groups left at some particular point here who fall outside of uh, out of a out of a chain of command. Really interestingly, yeah, that's very helpful. Really interestingly, I saw on um, a Twitter last night photos of a Belarusian unit that has formed to support Ukraine uh, and uh, and oppose the. A stranglehold of the Russian government on the Belarusian military. So very interesting. Mary Ellen, you have a few thoughts yeah, on this? No, I, I want to uh, emphasize that a lot of our colleagues who are Russia experts are telling us that this this war, as it's as knowledge is getting into uh, the Russian country itself and and its neighbors, is is proving to be very unpopular. And as the pain continues for the everyday person, they're going to wonder why they prices are suddenly their ruble is worth nothing. So that even the attempt to prevent information from getting out is going forward. So the more we can all do to spread real information, the better across the board. Um, and of course that goes to, should people go and volunteer to fight? Um, it, there, you know, it's, it's a tricky situation. Plainly, these individuals are not mercenaries because they're not being paid at a higher rate they're not being invited in, they're not fighting for the purpose of uh, making money that's a mercenary, they have to be paid more than the regular members of the forces. Um, the United States has not prohibited, we have discouraged but not prohibited our citizens from going to fight, so that means they're not violating any US law if they go. The real uh, issue for international law is, are these people trained or not? Can they be, as General Votel says, incorporated into the regular armed forces under IHL, you are um, looking at, at, at unprivileged combatants if they're not trained in the law of armed conflict, even if you brought them into your forces, because that's a standard under the Geneva Prisoners Convention that these individuals be trained in the law of armed conflict, and a lot of these folks just are not. But the, um, the, real, the risk to the Ukrainian military effort and why all these people aren't necessarily a boon to that effort, as we all know, those who are trained in the law of armed conflict are a disciplined fighting force. They respect their superior orders, but they re will refuse to obey an unlawful order. They will not commit war crimes. That helps the entire uh, success of the military effort. So it's, it's, it's a dilemma for Ukraine. Um, Harvey, so um, per the, the sort of comment that we were talking about before. Has Maybe we should get Yev on this, because Yev, Yev, you okay, yeah, like Yev, you're... I just, yeah, my, because yeah, I, I see this as a levy on mass taking place in um, Ukraine right now. And you might want to, you know, explain sure. to the audience what a levy on mass is and what it means. So there, for there, there are a couple of different elements here that are interesting. And I think uh, both the levy on mass and the foreign fighters potentially uh, can have Geneva Convention three protections. That's what we're ultimately talking about. The levy and mass is, is the presidential decree uh, under Ukrainian law uh, that all men over the age of 18 and under the age of 60 remain in country and are susceptible to draft. It's, it's a general mobilization. So those folks, as long as they meet the criteria, certain criteria, 
you know, education law of armed conflict, they wear distinctive insignia or the uniform, they could be members of the military, they have uh, combatant immunity, which means they can shoot and kill uh, Russians on site. They're not committing murder. And they also have POW protections if they're captured. The yes, foreign fighters. But that's is a, not foreign fighters. Foreign fighters. Yeah, I know. That's, so the second part is foreign fighters. So foreign fighters, this is a to totally different situation than we see, uh, we've seen in the Middle East, largely speaking, because here we have a sovereign government Right. So in foreign fighters in the Middle East, they came, they supported not a sovereign government, but some sort of insurgency, uh, something that's not recognized as a government. In my mind, um, them coming to support Ukraine as a foreign legion, wearing the distinctive insignia or the uniform, following the certain elements of the of the uh, uh, in the in the Geneva Conventions, they would meet. They would meet the criteria for protection uh, as POWs, and they would have combatant immunity. They would not be unlawful belligerents. And frankly, um, uh, the Ukrainians, I've also seen reports that the Ukrainians are granting some of them citizenship, which is just another indicia uh, of, of uh, being a legitimate, legitimate or part of the legitimate military force, uh, one of several that they would have to comply with. There have also been reports that the Russians, and I think Claire mentioned this at the outset, that the Russians would not uh, give Geneva protections to the, the, the foreign combatant, the foreign legion. That would be, if they meet the criteria that they have to, uh, to be uh, considered uh, a foreign legion, uh, not giving them protection, the Russians not giving them protection would be a violation of the law of war. Yeah, so um, does it worry you at all, Yev, that uh, Ukraine has told uh, foreign fighters to bring their own uniforms? So we don't know how how uniform their uniforms will be. Now, presumably, they're going to give them distinctive insignia. Um, if they wear their arms openly, they abide by the laws and customs of war, and they're under the command and control of Ukraine. I agree with you that they would be part of the regular Ukraine military, but it helps a lot if Ukraine gives them citizenship and, and actually gives them their uniforms. So that sure. And it does help, but I think we've seen also um, on, on Twitter and other uh, uh, mainstream media what, um, what appear to be uh, Ukrainian territorial defense forces that have a variety of different um, um, attire but they carry their weapons uh, openly and they have a yellow ribbon around their arm. Yes. That is a distinctive insignia that is That's sufficient uh, for them to be identified as part of the force. If, if both sides understand that and they can shoot uh, to kill on site that, that opposing force, then um, I don't see a major, it, it helps if they're wearing uniform, but the uniforms are also somewhat similar. The distinctive insignia, the yellow armband versus the, the Russians using red or, or white, um, that is also um, sufficient uh, distinction uh, of their status. So let me get to some audience questions now. Uh, we have a very distinguished audience, and I uh, apologize in advance that I won't be able to get to all the questions. But let me just address a few that I think uh, we haven't talked about. So Alan Luxemburg, uh, formerly uh, president of, of FPRI, um, says, um, it was US sanctions on Japan in 1941 that led to Pearl Harbor, because from Japan's point of view, sanctions were an act of war. If the sanctions today do the job they are meant to do, what's to keep Russia from considering them an act of war? Uh, any of the panelists want I, to? I'd love to one? answer that one. Go ahead, it's right, right in my valley, Wick. Um, the United Nations Charter changed a lot of things, clarified a lot of things. For example, uh, you don't need to declare war anymore. Um, that's not legally required. What is required is the fact of fighting. And that's also true of what counts in terms of the lawful response. So um, an armed attack, which is a kinetic, physical, military effort, that is a that results in a right of self-defense, but not the imposition of economic measures. It was absolutely clear in the UN Charter, in the drafting of the Charter, and in subsequent 
um, interpretations, including the authoritative decision by the International Court of Justice in the Nicaragua case, that economic measures, general economic measures, are not, those elements of coercion are not violations of Article 2.4. They can be uh, uh, violations of the principle of non-intervention. They can be um, uh, unlawful countermeasures um, resulting in economic claims. But without that kinetic aspect to them, they are not um, uh, uh, armed attacks. They do not count as what gives rise to the right of uh, a state to respond with self-defense, its own military action in response. The one close case in the Nicaragua decision, it, the provision of military um, uh, um, supplies of a very high level could be seen as an armed attack, but that wouldn't apply in the Ukraine case because there's already an ongoing war. So providing more supplies, we're not looking at the use ad bellum, what was the first unlawful use of force. And, this, and the, I also see the International Court of Justice is even backing off that supply of material. We're really focused these days, especially in the era of cyber um, communications and so forth on kinetic aspects. And that's one of the areas of law reform and clarity I think we need to do more on going forward. But let's be clear now, the economic sanctions on Russia cannot be determined by Russia to be the equivalent of a military strike on them. And they're not going to do that anyway, because they have their hands full already in Ukraine. It's also so, in so Russia's one, interest not to escalate the war and start treating um, economic sanctions as if they're being attacked by every country that's carrying out economic sanctions, because it, 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 that's the, you know, they've right. lost already. One place where your, your emphasis on uh, kinetic strikes might get pushback, uh, Mary Ellen, is in cyber, where this is hotly debated, and, and right. the different criteria for what counts as an, um, a, a use of force when you're talking about cyber, but that's a different matter. Yeah, let's leave that for now, because it's not front and center. It, it is an area that I feel we really need to stop being quite so, um, uh, uh, to giving too much um, to the military aspects and trying to fit this under a law of armed conflict, it's economic and communications. But you're right, it's a, it's a time of debate on that. Let's leave it for another day right now. So I just to do a quick, I, I would do a quick addendum. I, I, pers I participate in 1.5 talks with the Russians, um, the Chinese, and the US. And last week I was in one of these 1.5 talks and the Russian theorist opined that their doctrine is that they do see separate domains, cyber domain, conventional war domain, and the nuclear domain as clearly separate domains. But then the, the theorist said, under the Russian doctrine, any attack in one domain will generate a response in the other two domains as they see fit. And that they believe they can move between the th three domains, depending on what constitutes threats or existential threats, which was completely different from Mary Ellen, the world we have articulated with Nicaragua, with the, the, the international relations doctrine. We, we have generated this sort of clear set and our, our whole interpretation of the difference between Title 10 and Title 50. RV, I, I agree with you. I think there's been a real disintegration of respect for the rule of law and nothing says it more uh, clearly than Russia's invasion, that they think they had any reason to do that, that they could, but- uh, Mary Ellen, I'm gonna cut you let's off. Let's these debates. Get to some of the other questions. So I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, General Votel to answer this one. On the additional MiGs, is there a concern that Ukrainian forces could attack missile sites and air bases in Russia, those that are being used to attack Ukraine? This is from Joseph Lincoln. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that may be, I, to me, that wouldn't, I mean, the, this could, this in my view, could certainly fall under the, under the guise of self-defense by the Ukrainians protecting themselves against the threats that are being perpetrated upon them. So I don't know that that is necessarily the concern. I, I think the bigger concern on the MiGs here is that is the is how much this will demonstrably improve their ability to, um, to defend themselves. And I think there is, I I believe there is an assessment that that the effort to go through all of this is not gonna not gonna result in a in a demonstration 
demonstrable improvement in their ability to actually inflict more and more and more damage on the on the Russians. That they seem to be doing pretty well with that, with uh, anti tank weapons and uh, and the tools that they have and the and the airplanes they have. And they, and by the way, they actually do have airplanes left in their inventory. Uh, that uh, that that can get up and do this. So um, I think the, I think the, the concern falls more in those areas than it does about how they actually will use them. And and Joe, while we're while I'm talking to you, let me ask you another one of the questions here, which is that what about the use of drones to the Ukrainians? We haven't heard about uh, Ukrainian use of drones so far. At least I haven't. Um, but but why aren't we supplying Ukrainians with? drones and how would you rank it as far as its usefulness for uh, I think they're I think they're extraordinarily useful and I, I'm to me this would be a this would be a capability that we ought to be providing them I think they do have drones I actually think they have Turkish drones I don't know that as a as a fact but I think they actually do have some of those and that is know, correct uh, as, as we've seen, I think this is this is important not only for targeting, but it's really important for their surveillance and uh, and understanding what's happening out there. So I think this is a this is a definitely a capability that surveillance drones. Uh, yes, I have. And so so a actually, Claire, um, I can comment on this one. Um, they have the the Bayraktar TB2 drone that they have used effectively, very very effectively, in targeting uh, Russian armor and convoys. And so in some ways, I think the the uh, airframes is are red herring. I have no doubt that they'd be useful. I think the largest, the, the biggest objection to use to the transfer is the methodology is whether they come to American and NATO basis and how they get over there. I have no doubt they can be employed effectively. The air defense environment and, and the anti uh, air sort of area denial um, Maybe a factor, uh, a factor as far as deconflicting it, but the the uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles is what we're talking about. Would be a a if not a game changer, um, it's a system that is already being there, uh, being uh, employed there effectively, and it would uh, it would go a long ways to helping alleviate the issues that they face against Russian fires, the Russian artillery, thermal barracks, and missile systems. So we should be sending them more drones. I want to um, maybe close with a question here uh, from Jonathan Granoff, um, who is a very significant uh, expert around the um, nuclear side of things. And he asks, what is the possibility of a no first use Security Council resolution regarding Ukraine? What is the diplomatic off ramp from escalation? What are the limits of escalation and practicality in law? Let's start with the first bit of his question, which is the no first use Security Council resolution regarding Ukraine. Any hope for that? Harvey, do you want to address this briefly or you want um, to I just would to say that we all would support that. The question is, will Putin support it? Because it's a National Security Council resolution. So he has veto power. And A, would he support it? B, will he follow his word? The, that becomes sort of the question mark for us. And as Mary Ellen said, there's a number of unknowns about each of these issues. It's unknown how long the Ukrainians will be able to maintain their resistance. It's unknown how long the Russian people, if the war drags on and more and more information is given to them, that they will support Putin. It's unknown what's happening with Putin's own military if they are agreeing or disagreeing, are there fissures amongst them as this starts unwinding? We're losing you there, Harvey. Which is often referred to the Julius Caesar option in Russia as this drags on, there is a victory. So that issue is, do we, it's a great idea, would the Security Council be willing to pass it? And would you, I guess the question is, would you believe the Russians and would you believe Putin psychologically? But anything that gives him an off-ramp, anything that gives him a way to de-escalate. And then the question is what that diplomatic solution is and what does it mean for the Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis it's going forward, oh, over. Mary Ellen, you wanna uh, make sure, some? I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think there were two parts to the question. Um, do we need a Security Council resolution saying no first use of nuclear weapons? What's the off-ramp for Putin? I think those are two different things. The 
we don't need another Security Council resolution saying that there should be no first use of nuclear weapons. We have clear law. Um, I happen to think that the use of nuclear weapons would be prohibited for all the IHL reasons that prohibit the use of chemical or biologicals, but this International Court of Justice did leave the one possibility of the existential self-defense of a country that's not at play for Russia for sure. Uh, if it would help to remind Russia not to use a nuclear weapon in this conflict, go for it. Let's have all the resolutions in the General Assembly, the Security Council, Russia can veto it. That would look really odd. The really, the more important part of the question, I think, is off ramp. And that will be up to our colleagues who are, are expert in diplomacy back channel. What would it take you know, to rally the people who are influential, influential in Putin's life to get him to be rational? What is the role for the Chinese in this? If, we, if they're looking at a wrecked world economy where nobody can pay for Chinese goods, is that what, what will take for Xi to step in and tell Russia to back off? Obviously, Putin is the kind of person who needs some face saving. So, uh, you know, we, but, but a lot has already happened. He's paid a huge price. He's, I don't know what will convince him because Zelensky already offered in the early days when things were already beginning to look not, not what the Russians expected. He said, we'll talk about neutrality. We'll talk about the Finland solution. And I thought Russia would go for that. I thought that's what they wanted. And the fighting continued. And now it looks like it's, you know, how can you ask the Ukrainians to return to that generous offer? Um, so I hope your next panel will be on diplomatic solutions. Yeah, that's absolutely one of the panels that we'd like to address. Um, I would just close with a with a last uh, comment. There seem to be questions both in the Q&A and in the chat. So let me pull one from the chat. Daniel McLaughlin says, question for the panel. Can someone comment about the apparent gullibility of a significant percentage of the Russian population to believe the news accounts of the state controlled media? I realize Putin has shut down most independent news sources, but the Russians were conditioned from the late 1980s to know that what the Soviet government was telling them was simply not true. And I want to add to that, what can we do to help educate the Russian people? Because ultimately, um, regime change in Russia um, is the best likeliest way uh, to end these sorts of uh, murderous, aggressive invasions, though, of course, we don't know who would be replacing Putin. But um, but it's sort of we're in the hands of the Russian people to some extent. Does anyone on the panel want to comment about disinformation in Russia? General yeah, Botel? I'll jump on that in a second here. So I, I would just say, Claire, I think one of the things we have been we have done well, the U.S. and NATO has done well, is really get get our messaging straight on this and get get truthful information out into the out into the space as best as we can. I you know I was largely behind a very courageous leader on the ground in in uh, in the form of President Zelensky who is who is communicating about his well as anybody we've ever seen uh, in a situation like this. But I think it is incredibly important that we continue uh, to, um, you know, my word, attack in this information area here with uh, with the truthful information out there by all channels, uh, frankly. Uh, this And this is so important for uh, for what we're doing to continue to overwhelm uh, the, the Russians in terms of truthful information. This ultimately worked for us against an organization like ISIS, our ability to overwhelm them on Twitter and everything else really allowed us to uh, really get the message out about what was happening there and what this organization actually was. So there has to be as deliberate of an effort in the information space as there is in the military space, as in the diplomatic space, and as in the economic space. To me, this is absolutely essential. We actually have the momentum here, and we need to keep this going forward. Absolutely. Claire, if I, if I may, as a, as a Russian speaker, um, I've, I've had um, the opportunity to listen to some first, um, uh, you know, primary sources, and, and they're fascinating. There's clearly a societal divide in my mind. Uh, there have been thousands of Russian, very brave Russians that have come out on the streets at great personal risk to themselves, um, especially in light of the, the new law where there's, they're uh, risking 15 years in jail. Um, but there have also been some interesting reports, and these are sort of the men on the street, anecdotal at this point, uh, of uh, 
people just being stopped in Moscow, ordinary Muscovites. And their, their take is either they don't believe that uh, Russia is engaged in any sort of conflict with Ukraine, uh, because all they do is monitor. There's, there's not much free media left. Uh, the, the main uh, uh, liberal or dissenting voices has, have been silenced, um, and certainly in the last weeks have been silenced. But also, um, they, they say things like, Putin's right. And the, the, uh, the commentator was attempting to show pictures of, of bomb buildings and things like that. And the response is, Putin's right. Putin's right. I support Putin. And it's generational. The younger people, those that have more access to the, the, the free world, uh, media, internet, um, are against the war. But the older generation, and maybe out of a sense of nostalgia, maybe out of a sense of brainwashing by the state media, um, would like to see a, a resurgent or more powerful uh, uh, Russia. And so uh, there have also been uh, some, some videos and reporting of uh, the letter Z, which does not exist in the, in the Cyrillic alphabet, appearing in different places around Russia. And so um, I, I suspect that there is going to be some level, significant level of support for Putin's action. And um, uh, how that is affected by the ongoing sanctions and, and the, the total destruction of, of the, the Russian economy in, in the short term, uh, it'll be difficult to see. But uh, there is some support. Um, it's unclear what that level of support is. And uh, the Russian people are digging in, the Ukrainian people have dug in, and it'll it'll potentially come down to a test of wills. And Yev, I'm going to have to over, cut over. you off here. This has been an extraordinary panel. I'm so glad uh, that you were able to join us. I'm so proud of the um, level of talent and sophistication that we have uh, at Searle with our executive board, our advisory council, and, and those who work with us on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, thrilled that we had a, a fantastic turnout in our uh, virtual audience today. Uh, anyone who would like to engage with Searle, um, either to engage with our, our conferences as a subject matter expert or to support our efforts, please write to us at Searle uh, at appc.upenn.edu, and we will be thrilled to get to know you. Uh, thank you so much for your participation today. Please be on the lookout for future panels. We will be holding regular panels and possibly uh, closed door briefings for experts as well. So I'll look forward to hearing your thoughts about what you would like to hear from us uh, in this conflict uh, the next time around. Thank you so much and thank you to our panelists. Thank you, thank you Claire. Claire. Thank you, Claire. Bye-bye, everyone.